Good afternoon, my name is Gitanjali Alapati. I'm a senior at James Clement High School, Madison City, Alabama. And today I'm gonna talk about malaria. So malaria comes from uh, two Latin terms, mala and area, which means bad air. And it's caused by a protozoan parasite that belongs to the genus Plasmodium and the phylum Epicomplexa. There are approximately 120 species in this genus. However, only five of them actually cause infections to humans. So these three gentlemen that you can see on the screen have provided us with the initial information about uh, malaria and the parasite. Sir Charles Laverin was the first one to observe the parasite in human blood. Kemal Galdi, on the other hand, he observed the parasite in the red blood cells. Ronald Ross was the first one to observe the parasite in the mid-gut of the mosquito, which gave us the information of how the transmission actually occurs from one human to another. So where exactly is the parasite's home? Uh, the parasite uh, requires two hosts to complete its life cycle, hence it's diagenetic. Its primary host is the female Anopheles mosquito, and the secondary host is humans. Uh, based on which host uh, the parasite is in, it has two different cycles. It's asexual or sexual cycles. So I'm gonna start talking about the asexual cycle in uh, man. When a mosquito takes a blood meal, it releases uh, thousands of sporozoids into the blood, which then travel through the blood and uh, are received by the liver. Uh, they enter into the reticular endothelial cells of the liver and start feeding on the contents present in the cells. Soon they undergo multiple fission to form these structures called cry cryptozoids that then burst out of the liver cell and they either reinvade another liver or an RBC. If they do reinvade a liver, it starts with the exoerythrocytic cycle. Or if it does invade an RBC, it starts with the erythrocytic cycle. When it invades an RBC, it starts to feed on the hemoglobin, especially it digests the globin part of it, and the heme is left out as hemozoin. After many developmental stages, it then undergoes multiple fission to form structures called neurozoids. We also observe these granules that are uh, nothing but antigens that are released by the parasite. So after two days after the erythrocytic cycle, these neurozoids burst out, and then the, uh, the antigens come in contact with uh, the human immunity system, and hence we observe fever every third day. The merozoids either reinfect an RBC or they develop into these gametocytes, which then halt there and do not develop into gametes because neither the blood pH nor the temperature is suitable for it. At this point, if a mosquito does take a blood meal, then the gametocytes then develop into gametes that then undergo fertilization to form a zygote that penetrates through the crop wall and forms a cyst. The cyst is called an oocyst that undergoes further meiotic and mitotic divisions to form the sporozoids that are actually again infectious to humans. The sporozoids burst out of the cyst and then reside in the salivary glands, waiting for the mosquito to take another blood meal to enter into humans. So it's a very complex life cycle, and by this we understand that the mosquito requires, uh, the parasite requires the mosquito to take two blood meals to complete its life cycle. So the symptoms, uh, they are observed when the toxic hemozoin is released. Uh, we, there are three stages for the symptoms. The first is cold stage, when we observe shivers, coldness, and giddiness. And the next is the hot stage, when the body's temperature rises approximately to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have the sweating stage, which uh, the body temperature comes down because of profuse sweating. In chronic patients, we also observe this condition called splenomegaly because the spleen filters out these parasites, causing uh, swelling of the spleen. And patients are also anemic due to the bursting of the RBCs. So how do we actually diagnose the patients uh, if they have uh, the parasite in them? We have three tests, uh, microscopy, rapid diagnostic tests, and PCR. Microscopy is this classic diagnostic where we observe the blood site under the microscope and see if the, pres if the parasite is present. A rapid diagnostic test, on the other hand, it detects the protein released by the parasite. And it's like, similar to a pregnancy test. PCR, on the other hand, it detects the nucleic acid presence, uh, DNA or RNA of the parasite. And however, the PCR is not recommended for any uh, large campaigns. And in such situations, RDTs are much more uh, recommended. We have a list of drugs that are against malaria. A uh, few target the processes of the pa parasite, such as the digestion of hemoglobin or the DNA or RNA synthesis of the parasite, or they target the specific organelles, such as epicoplast or mitochondria. But when we talk about the efficiencies of the drugs, the list almost disappears, and this is because of resistance. We have observed resistance before in two of the most commonly used drugs, chloroquine and artemisinin. Chloroquine is a very cost-effective drug, and it has been used as a prophylaxis like as in table salt, and we have observed resistance twice, once in Southeast Asia and once in South America. Artemisinin is also like chloroquine, and it is given as a combination therapy, and we have observed a resistance in this drug in the Asian regions. 
vaccine is another alternative that we always look for. And, uh, but it is difficult to develop a vaccine for this disease because one, we do not develop a sterilizing immunity against this disease, which means that if one gets malaria once, does not mean that they will not get it another time, um, like in measles or any other uh, viral infection. And this parasite is also very complex compared to any virus. So it, they have this capacity to develop proteins uh, against any immunity response that we develop. Keeping these in mind, we are uh, focusing on uh, manufacturing vaccines uh, that are mostly state specific, such as for zoid stage uh, vaccine, blood stage vaccines, and transmission blocking stage vaccines. Currently, we have developed a vaccine, which is called the RTSS vaccine that is under clinical trial since 1995. This actually targets a circumsporozoid protein of the parasite, and we have seen an efficacy of 30 to 50 percent, which is really good. Um, there is a lot of role uh, played by genes in this, uh, in this disease. Uh, there's this concept called complexity of infection that uh, discusses uh, about the types of parasite that actually causes the symptoms. So if there is only one type of parasite that's causing the symptoms, then we call it a complexity of infection of one and it's a monogenetic infection. If there's more than one type of parasite, then we will call it a complexity of infection greater than one, and it's referred to as a polygenetic infection. We have different tools to actually uh, look for the different types. Uh, one is a molecular barcode, which uh, we gather all of the 24 single nucleotide polymorphisms that are distributed throughout the genome and put them together to compare and understand different types of parasites. Uh, then we also have this microsatellite, which actually, uh, we use a specific sequence present at a specific location in the DNA of a specific parasite and then understand uh, the different types that are present. So why, you might ask, why do we need to know uh, different, why, how many types are affecting when they cause the same symptoms? It is necessary because when we are actually administering a drug or a vaccine to a certain population, uh, we need to understand if there's symptoms recurring, if it is because of recrudescence, that is if the parasite is developing some kind of resistance or if it's reinfection, which means the initial parasite has been uh, removed, but another completely different type, type is causing the uh, disease. So based on this, we can understand which drug is actually effective in which population. Uh, so prevention is better than cure, and especially in this case, and hence there are many CDC recommended preventive measures. Uh, mo most of them involve uh, blocking any uh, you know, transmission occurring between the two hosts. Uh, including insecticide-treated nests, nets, uh, indoor residual spraying, larva control, all of these blocking any contact between the two hosts. And we also have massive drug administrations where we give a population a drug as a prophylaxis. And many organizations uh, have been using these preventive measures to, and implementing them in regions that, have, uh, that are endemic to these parasites and mosquitoes, such as the WHO uh, malaria elimination program started in 2016, or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's approach to malaria elimination. So thank you. If you have any questions, you can email me at the email address on the slide. Thank you.